Welcome to Innovating Leadership, Co-Creating Our Future. I'm your host, Maureen Metcalf, founder and CEO of the Innovative Leadership Institute. I am delighted that on our show today is the returning Greg Moran. He's a C-level digital strategy and change leadership executive with extensive global operations experience. Today, we're going to be talking about how employee listening is evolving. Greg, as the COO of the company Aware, will talk about his experience with Aware and in the field overall. So Greg, let's launch into what is Aware and what is employee listening? Yeah, it's interesting. So we've talked a lot about strategy in the past on our uh, shows, and we've had some really great dialogues about how strategy is evolving in light of the experiences that we've all had in the last few years. And today, I think shifting our focus to, let's call it the implementation of strategy, where the rubber meets the road is what you actually do inside of a company and how you actually lead inside of a company. While we certainly didn't plan when we founded AWARE back in 2016, 2017, we didn't really plan for what was going to happen in the world starting in 2020. It has been a great opportunity for us, and that takes nothing away from the tragedy of what's happened as a result of the pandemic. But the pandemic accelerated a whole bunch of trends that were already in play prior to 2020. For us at AWARE, it's been an opportunity to accelerate our learning and to accelerate our product development around a category of product that's really about employee listening and managing risk inside of a company, while at the same time using that listening as a way to support your employees and gain insights about your business and your customers in a much, much more rapid fashion, in a much, much more accurate fashion. And so the heart of what we do fits very well into the world that we find ourselves in today, which I'll characterize as largely digital and largely hybrid. So you've talked about the distinction between listening and monitoring and spying. Help our listeners understand why listening is good, even if they are not into being spied upon. Yeah, it's a great question, and it's one that actually comes up pretty often as we talk to prospects about it, because there's a whole category of software that's been emerging and is getting understandably pretty negative press as companies try to figure out how they monitor their employees to make sure they're working hard and doing a good job. And we are the really the quintessential opposite of that. So we distinguish ourselves significantly from what I'll call monitoring and say we're in the business of listening at scale inside of an organization with the express purpose of giving employees who would not naturally have a voice a voice of connecting the top of the house with the front line and the front line with each other. So we're really in this space of gaining insights from the conversations that are going on across the company digitally at scale in a way that has nothing to do with employee productivity, right? But it will ultimately in the long term impact the productivity of the organization itself because of course those insights can be valuable, whether it's something incredibly practical, like in a frontline business that has brick and mortar, you have frontline people who are interacting with customers every day and they're learning in real time what customers value and what customers don't value. How cool is it to be able to get that data essentially in real time as people are interacting and saying, wow, I had three customers come in today and say they really hated our new product line. Or I noticed today that our register system really bogs down when you have more than 10 people in the store checking out at the same time or whatever it might be. Those data points give you the ability to react in real time and tell a story about how you better support your employees. And you're in effect giving them a voice in the head office. Whereas you think about traditional data gathering, you send in some people to do a study, they do a study, they collate the data, the data gets then reviewed by a bunch of people in the middle of the organization, who by the way, are all gonna spin it to make sure they don't look bad. And by the time it gets to somebody who actually can decision it, A, a lot of time has passed, and B, the signal may have been manipulated to the point where it's not very authentic and not very accurate. I remember years ago, I happened to be consulting very close with my boss and our her boss came in to visit. He was going around to talk to each of us to see what we could improve. 
in the conversation, I was thinking, I don't really have any recommendations. And isn't that unfortunate that I don't have anything? And then I realized anytime I had a recommendation, I would talk to my boss and we'd figure it out and we'd either implement or try something or she'd tell me that I should do something else. But whatever it was, there was a real-time signal and a reaction. And yet the organization clearly did not have that or we wouldn't have had the guy walking around to say, what would you do if somebody cared? Because if we were paying attention, somebody did care and we were doing things. Right. And I do think most leaders in most organizations sincerely care and sincerely want to get an accurate picture of how they can better support their employees. Not only as a matter of that's fulfilling work for both the employee and the leader, but because it increases the fidelity of your business model. You're ultimately going to be a better business if you're getting signals in real time about things you can do better as a company, whether that's internal to the employees and the employee experience, or whether that's external to the business in relation to its customers, its vendor partners. I'm curious then, why why is this not happening without employee listening? There have been many, many attempts, and there still are attempts in place to try and do that. There's lots of survey tools, for example. I don't know any large corporation that doesn't do an annual employee engagement survey of some kind, whatever they might call it, you know, employee satisfaction, employee engagement, et cetera. Well, I think that model, you know, has been made very famous by Gallup. And to give Gallup full credit, Gallup has done an amazing job asking questions to get it down to a group, it's called the Gallup Q12. So they've got 12 questions that they've ironed out. The problem with it is A, it's periodic. B, it's highly delayed. It takes months to collate the data from that survey process. And C, depending on what the incentives are inside the company, the questions get skewed. So at my previous employer, we use the Gallup process, but we also tied the outcomes of the survey to manage your comp. So what we learned in the first couple of years is by tying it to compensation, you drove a whole bunch of unintended behaviors in the people who were being surveyed and the people who managed the people that were being surveyed. And so you got this realization that you had to now filter the data very differently. And even with the filtering, it still got very, very difficult to get an accurate signal. So we we discovered things like managers throwing five for five parties. So the best score you can get is a five. And so they would literally have five for five parties and they would take people out for a $500 dinner so that they would get fives on their survey. You also had some interesting dysfunctions like people who worked for really bad managers would give them all fives. And the company was very confused by this, right? And so they had to do some research and they dug in and what they found out that if you gave a bad manager low scores, the reward you got was that you had to sit down with that manager for hours and hours on end in meetings to plan how your scores were going to improve next year. Guess who those people don't want to spend time with? (laughs) Especially when you think it's not going to bring about any change. Exactly. And I definitely don't want to discount the value of survey tools. I'm just here to argue that we can do better now, right? We have tools that are way more effective than periodic surveys. You get survey fatigue as well. You, You know, a lot of people say, oh, well, we just do little mini surveys every four weeks. Well, who answers those surveys? Generally, what you see is the pattern that emerges is only people who have a point to make take the time to respond to the survey. So the survey gets this negative skew. You're still not getting an accurate picture. Listening and listening technology like what we use is purely listening at a macro level, not at a micro level, not at an individual level, at a macro level to the authentic conversations that are occurring inside of the organization in real time and in response to either exogenous or internal events that are occurring that could affect how people are thinking inside the company. So imagine the CEO announces a new program of some kind for the company. You can now know in real time how that landed. So the next day. The next day, you can begin to target your change management strategy around what's actually occurring. And you can figure out a third of the people didn't get it, a third of the people got it and hate it, a third of the people got it and love it. And you can tune messaging to address those concerns and in some cases go, oh, wow, 
we got that wrong, right? Like, I mean, it could be even super practical things. Like every fall, every company updates its benefit plans. And they typically put on an announcement that says, here's all the changes to the benefit plan. Well, now the next opportunity you're going to actually have to get real feedback from your employees on that is the following June when you do your employee engagement survey. What if I could target the next day and find out that 90% of my employees hated this change? Would you still roll out that change? Probably not. So walk us through how the mechanics of how this happens. So I, I'm assuming you don't have microphones around the office listening. This is one of the interesting things that the hybrid world that emerged out of the pandemic created a real acceleration for us in terms of the quality of the signal that we can get because conversations in the hybrid enterprise today happen digitally. The water cooler is Slack or Teams or WebEx or Zoom chat. That's now the water cooler. What we're doing in our software is listening for, and you actually have the ability to go look for, trends that are occurring. So like, just like when you see on Twitter, trending topics. We basically are doing that inside of the collaboration environment of the organization. Again, not down to an individual level, but at a macro level, we're looking for those signals that emerge naturally out of the social network that is your company. And we can even tell you how, how strongly topics are connected to each other and how strongly parts of the organization are connected to each other. And so you begin to get this digital image or this digital footprint of your social network inside of your company. And with it comes all of these actionable insights that give you a sense for how's overall sentiment, how's sentiment on this specific topic, how's sentiment in this specific department, how healthy is the conversation. So we've built AI that's incredibly accurate because we've had years and multiple iterations to get this really, really precise that, for example, distinguish between the sentiment of a conversation and the health of the conversation. A lot of thinking in this space is dominated by just looking for sentiment, negative sentiment versus positive sentiment. That's not particularly insightful. I can say something like, this project is awful. That's negative sentiment. It's not unhealthy. It may be inherently true that the project is awful. It may be badly run, it, whatever it may be. But if I say this project is awful and my manager is a star, 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 that's toxic. And that's very different. And the signal that comes from that is different, right? And if you see toxicity emerging around the topic, that's another source of insight for you versus just the sentiment. So we had an example from a customer that happens to be a, you know, has a big frontline workforce and they changed the policy around employee parking. And they immediately saw a flare of negative sentiment about the topic of the parking policy. And they shared this story with us, and it was really, it really gave a clear illustration of the value and the difference between those two. And they said, shame on us. This is the people who kind of managed the listening, right? They said, shame on us. We didn't raise that as an action item, and we didn't respond to the employees' concerns about the change in policy. So a week later, there's this big flare of toxicity. And the flare of toxicity was no longer about the parking. The flare of toxicity is they're not even listening to us. <laughs> That's a different problem, right? So hopefully that illustrates the, the difference between those two things. Yeah, I'm thinking for anyone who's done an enterprise software implementation, we go through our phases and there's a, it's never going to end. And there's a bunch of stuff wrong and we've missed a date. And this is kind of an awful experience. That's predictable. I certainly haven't worked on all software projects, but there's pretty much an expectation that when you hit this phase, people are exhausted and you're not done and stuff's wrong. And so to your point, the project is awful and it is predictably awful. I don't know any project that I am aware of or have worked on that hasn't gone through the awful stage. And yet it's not necessarily toxic. It's just, it's a slog and we don't like the slog. I also believe that the slog can be characterized by certain predictable attributes. Having done a lot of project <laughs> management in my life, I believe that you can anticipate 
and you can respond to signals that will help you minimize the impact of the slog and either make it more bearable or address the issues that are creating that fatigue. Listening is one way that you would pick up on that signal. Oh, we're getting close to the slog here. We should dig into what's happening, what's causing the slowdown, what are the roadblocks, what are the issues that we're running into, and be proactive about it. So this ability to target your change management is powerful, I think, in the context of any transformational change. Yeah, I was just thinking exactly that the change management plan often does have the, how do we navigate? Now I know when the slog started. Tangential, but curious to me that in pre-computer days, the, the community shaman was responsible for ensuring that the community felt healthy and engaged, and the shaman would do the same listening and create interventions to elevate the health of the community. This conceptually, certainly different than a shaman, but conceptually, the idea of listening is a very age-old construct. At one level, it's really about getting the balance between facilitation and listening right, at the risk of maybe offending any anarchists that might listen <laughs> on this. Anarchy actually doesn't work very well. There's insufficient structure. We also know that too much structure equally does not work. And any community to be successful over time has to operate with a framework. And that framework needs paying attention to over time. It doesn't self-propagate. And so the example that you gave of a shaman, right? The shaman was an invention of society to deal with this lack of structure, right? And to create a structure, that light touch facilitation that just steers the community in a healthy way. Imagine that being exactly what you can do inside of a large organization now is have sufficient insight to know where facilitation is needed and where you want to nudge the community in a specific direction. And that could be just even around things like culture. People talk about culture a lot, but there's not a lot of practical ways to actually work on culture. This is one of those tools that can actually help you reinforce culture in little ways and potentially even in big ways. Often when I'm talking to prospects, I've worked at Ford Motor Company and then I worked at Nationwide. I can tell you at Ford, it, you know, I'm, I'm overstating for a fact, but if you didn't use an F-bomb in an email, you weren't serious. If you used an F-bomb in an email at Nationwide, you were fired. Now, neither of those is exactly true, but the point is the cultures were distinctly different, right? And I'm not here to argue one was better than the other, but the cultures were distinctly different and they needed reinforcing. And while you know Ford may not be thrilled about how many F-bombs got used in emails, I think they also recognize that if you were going to start to move the culture in a different way, you would have to do that over time. It's not gonna happen overnight. And tooling like ours can be one of your ways of getting that done. So, you know, we actually do have aspects of our capability that you would want to have in place in any shared community that are things like, how do you ensure that no sexual harassment is going on inside of your digital collaboration environment? You know, when the pandemic hit, there was this proposed theory that it would reduce the amount of sexual harassment in the workplace. And I remember, given the business that I'm in, thinking, oh, that's so not true. And it turned out that I was right, sadly. Sexual harassment actually went up. Just different. Right. Because just as we've seen on social media, when there is no personal accountability in the interaction, it gets toxic a lot faster. Right. Well, guess what happened inside of companies? The exact same thing. It's a little harder to harass somebody to their face. There's an accountability in that moment. But when it's digital, there's zero accountability in that moment, right? And so we've seen an increase in that. So there's also elements of our tools that just get at these basic, I call big S safety concerns that are obviously important to every employee. I mean, you can go survey your employees and say, how many of you would like us to make sure there's no sexual harassment? 100% will say yes. Except the harassers, maybe. <laughs> there may Even be they will 2%. say yes, but they now know that they can't. <laughs> right? Because nobody's going to say out loud, oh, no, totally, that'd be awesome. <laughs> right? 
So all of that, I think, goes to this employee experience and, and what are the tools that are available in today's hybrid digital world that you can use to make sure that your community is what you want it to be and has the identity that you want it to be. And, you know, we're hearing horrifying stories that emerge from companies like Act Blizzard Activision, a gaming company that just horrifying stories that emerged out of that culture. And I think to some degree, there was some cover up that went on at the top of the house. But as I've read the stories, it also has become clear to me that some of it was not cover up. It was ignorance. Like they didn't know it was going on to the degree that it was going on. And that's probably also true. Not that that lets anybody off the hook. We should not be let off the hook when things like that are happening inside of our organizations. But to assume that I know my people and they are good people is ridiculous. Even good people do things that are not well thought out. Particularly when it's part of the culture. I look at some of the things that, that, that happened at Activision, and I can't imagine that everybody that participated in those events was comfortable with it. But if the price of acceptance was that behavior inside of that culture, you're left with a fairly drastic choice, right? And history has taught us that even good people will make bad decisions when the cost of making the good decision is too high. I have made bad decisions and done things that are fairly stupid. Uh, low impact. I'm not out belligerently harassing people, but I've certainly said things in a work setting that I would take back today if I could. Absolutely. And and then the power of that culture is significant, right? Mm -hmm. And and I've been, that's an extreme example at Activision, at least I hope it is, but it's certainly been well documented that you had what were pretty reasonable people that got caught up in a set of activities that were really sort of shocking in today's modern work environment. Let's step back and give a little more information about how this works. You've talked about listening through Slack and those things. Do you get a dashboard? Do I get a report every day? Can I log on and just look at trending words like I would on Twitter? There's pretty much zero technical lift. So all of these collaboration platforms are all cloud-based systems today. So whether you're talking Slack, Teams, WebEx, uh, Zoom, you know, long list of collaboration platforms, Workplace from Meta, all of those products today are all cloud-based. Right. Including the email, right? So it's not just not the including collaboration. email. This okay. is just the collaboration. There's okay. a big difference. We can talk about that maybe in a couple of minutes, distinguishing between the type of communication that happens in email and the type of communication that happens in digital, essentially chat platforms. It's very different. And so you manage that very differently. So we're talking here about chat platforms. I mean, by the way, email is pretty much all gone to the cloud as well. Honestly, for completeness, we'll probably ingest email content at some point just so our customers know that every base is covered. But the authentic conversations that I think give you the insight and that need to be managed in a very specific way are these those in these digital platforms. I mean, the average Slack message is five words or less. The average email is over 40. It's a different medium. Right, and it has a different purpose, and it has is built on a completely different paradigm, and so you end up with the content being very different. So, the technical lift is fairly easy because we're cloud based as well, and we have a ton of security wrapped around this. But basically, when a customer signs up for our product, we connect our software to their chat platform, and then we're essentially within ten minutes, we're ingesting that content, and then they have the ability using our interface to set up a set of policies that they want to use to manage even some of the basic things you have to have around any collaboration platform, including email. You know, if you're a bank, there's a whole bunch of rules about these people aren't allowed to talk to these people and, you know, they can't talk about these topics. And if you're a PCI certified company, you can't have credit cards out on your collaboration platform or you lose your PCI certification. So there's all these just complex compliance things that we help you do. And we've built a whole bunch of intelligence around looking for things like that, that range from sexual harassment that we were talking about earlier to credit card numbers, pictures of credit card numbers, not safe for work images, just all the stuff that you, in order to be compliant in certain industries, think healthcare, like HIPAA compliance, those sorts of things, or 
just to have a safe, responsible work environment, you have to have those management tools in place around these digital platforms. The other half of our product is what we've been talking about in terms of this listening. And yes, in that context, there is a dashboard. It's a real-time dashboard. And then we also do some compilation on a nightly basis to compile and give you insights into the broader things that are going on inside of your social network. And then there's a whole bunch of tools that you can use to dig in more deeply on those trending topics and how do they relate to each other and are they toxic or are they just negative sentiment or positive sentiment? And if they're positive sentiment, what's driving that? And is it different in different parts of the organization? So there's a whole bunch of tooling that's ever evolving and increasing number of AI models that we're using to provide insight. I know we typically focus on the negative stuff. It's unhealthy, it's trending negative, but it seems equally as important to focus on what are we doing that's working And how do we amplify that if, in fact, our focus is positive employee experience, positive customer experience, both of those linked to building on the good rather than clearly if there's something heinous, you need to fix it. And not over indexing on, especially if it's a small amount of negativity. Yeah, completely agree. And I think that reinforcing the positive often addresses future negative consequences. I'm struck by the tone and approach that Howard Schultz has taken at Starbucks since he's been brought back into the company for the third time. And lots of it has been written around that and and what he's doing. And in fact, there's going to be a lot more discussion, I think, in the next week or two on this. But basically, the first thing that he said was the fundamental issue here is that we're not listening to our employees. Starbucks employees were famously getting fairly agitated at Starbucks. The regime prior to Howard was looking at that as a problem, and Howard said, no, no, when the employees are unhappy, it's not a problem. We're the problem. We're not listening to the employees. Those are the people that serve our customers. So we need to figure out what it is they're saying to us, and then we need to fix those problems, because if our employees are unhappy with how we've set them up to serve our customers, how long do you think it's going to be before we can't serve customers? And those customers aren't having the experience we want, et cetera. So job one for him has been, we've got to start listening. And if you see the actions he's taken, one of the first signals he got was, our employees don't feel safe in some of our stores. I'd say the previous regime was like, well, too bad, so sad, right? Everybody's welcome at our stores. Howard went exactly the other direction. He said, if we can't operate a store where our employees are safe or feel safe, we won't operate that store. We'll close the store. Right. And then we'll figure out, see if we can figure out a way to serve that neighborhood or that populace in a way that's safe. But job one is our employees have to feel safe. Right. I think that's brilliant. And it's exactly the sort of thing that we you know, want to help with is like giving leaders the insights that would allow them to have a voice from their employees that gives them the tools they need to make better decisions. These kinds of tools and specifically your tools also equip leaders to do something different and require them. So the example of the client who didn't listen and then they got toxic because we've been telling them this wasn't working and you did nothing, now we're angry. It is now positioning leaders to have information, but once you've got information, you need to do something. Yeah, it comes with accountability. I don't know any leader who doesn't believe that accountability leads to better outcomes, right? So I think that becomes a natural outgrowth of this, to your point, is if the signal's there and it's clear, now you have an obligation to act. And that's actually how healthy organizations run, right? You're getting accurate signals, you're getting inputs, and then you're accountable for doing things that make it better. And if you're incapable or uncommitted to that, you'll move out of that job fairly rapidly. As we like to say, we'll invite you to be successful somewhere else. I was in a conversation earlier today and teaching a new leadership class. And one of the questions was with Gen Z and millennials and, you know, pick the list of groups you talk about, what's changing now about leadership? And one of the key answers was, you still need to do all the stuff you did before. You still need to plan. You still need to budget, all that. And you need to attend to employee experience and customer experience, which you're saying here are interlinked, starting with the employee experience. 
Yeah, it's interesting. And when you look at particularly younger populations and in a hybrid world, this is how they interact. I was talking earlier about the difference in the paradigm between email and between chat-based systems. Email was designed off of the paradigm of the inter-office memo. Most Gen Z have never even seen an inter-office memo. They've never seen an inter-office memo with the little string tie thing that made its way around the organization on a cart and was dropped at a mail stop and then put on your desk. These are all foreign terms. How many people have seen a carbon copy, even though we still use the term CC in an email system? Almost none. So that paradigm is nonsensical to somebody who doesn't have a connection to the physical reality that was the model for email. And it was a formal communication method, right? I remember the inner office memos of my youth in, in, in business, and there was a formal way that they were written, and that was the paradigm for email. It literally would say to, from, CC, and then the first paragraph Subject. would be, the purpose of this memorandum is to blah, 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 and then content, and then follow-ups. And so you still see that reflected largely in email today. And that is an effective mode of communication for that yes. type of information. Right. And it's not irrelevant. It becomes a documentation tool largely in today's world. But millennials and Gen Z grew up in a world of chat. And chat was built on a paradigm of conversation. That's very different. And so you, what you find is these chat-based systems are very conversational. They're very approachable to those generations of workers. We had a perfect example of it today. So we had an all hands meeting scheduled on Zoom this morning at 11 o'clock and Zoom was down globally at 11 o'clock this morning. Zoom was down. So we could not get on to Zoom to do our all hands meeting. And we have a Slack channel that we use to coordinate kind of the broader things called the general channel. It blew up. And we had like 15 minutes of just, why don't we try Discord? Why don't we do it in this? We could do it in this. We could do it in this. We could do it in that. Let's start a huddle. It was hilarious to watch and the speed with which this conversation progressed, right? And I eventually jumped in and I said, okay, first thing we're going to do is gonna, we're going to wait 15 minutes and then we're going to retry Zoom. And if Zoom doesn't work, since I know that everybody in the company also has Teams, I will post a Teams link and we'll shift the meeting to Teams. And then the conversation continued. And then at 11.15, we tried Zoom. It still wasn't up. I posted the link to Teams. Everybody jumped on and we were able to have our meeting. But the communication was fascinating to see the speed and just the rapid fire and the idea generation around what we could do to solve this problem. And then, you know, little sidebar parts of the conversation where people were slamming on Zoom or slamming on Teams, right? And it was just fascinating to watch. But that's how those generations communicate. And it was all, by the way, I could show it to you. There's not a message in there that's more than seven or eight words. You and I are on Teams. Our producer, Dan, and I are on Teams. And often when we're working late at night or a Friday night or something, we're going back and forth, you know, doing the work. And, you know, what are you doing tonight? When are you going to stop working? Right. And there is a parallelism that goes on. So the beauty of chat-based communication, and we've all had the experience if you've had uh, teenage kids of them texting with each other while they're sitting on the couch next to each other watching a TV show, right? You might be like, that's really weird. Why don't you just talk to each other? Well, because they're watching the TV show <laughs> and they can multitask. Well, that's not something that happens in email. You don't multitask when you're doing email. You I write try. Yeah. And how well does it work? <laughs> right? It takes forever to get the email done. And then you go back and read it. And you're like, oh, wow. I got to that. I looked drunk when I was, <laughs> and I don't work while drunk. So, <laughs> exactly. But chat, there's nothing hard about dropping five words into a Slack channel when you're in a meeting. It's not even considered rude in today's world. I mean, it can be if it's all you're doing, but the occasional, you know, I think there's an expectation now that if you can dispense with a problem in five seconds, that's really important to somebody who's not in the room in the meeting. Why wouldn't you, right? Mm -hmm. It would be rude not to. Oh, you were in the room and you could have just answered with a yes or no. 
what kind of manager are you? <laughs> right? So obviously that has to be balanced to be against be here now and the presence mm. that's required for effective collaboration in, you know, in a meeting. Real time. Yeah. But I don't think there's any any expectation today that people are a hundred percent exclusive. And in fact, these communication tools make it easy for you to not be a hundred percent exclusive to the moment, but also not miss the moment. Coming back to say I'm a chief HR officer and I'm using the aware tools and I want to just see what my employee sentiment is. I assume every day I'm checking my dashboard. Yeah, so we've got a dashboard that that has some real-time aspects and obviously some of the things we were talking around around compliance. Like you want to know immediately if somebody is sexually harassing somebody and you want to know who it is. We can help with that, right? But again, we're looking for the needle in the haystack. The beauty of it is if you're using, for example, if you're trying to solve that like through human moderation, A, you've got huge amounts of content. B, you've got a moderator who's not objective. C, they have to look at everything to find the one thing. What we do is remove you from having to worry about that. A, our software never gets tired. B, it's precisely looking only for the things that you want it to look for. And C, it only gives you those things. So you don't have to walk through the mud to find the one problem. So you said it's anonymous unless there's a risk factor. Overall sentiment, it has uh, some algorithm yes, exactly. and it That's doesn't all say... all at a group level. Okay. Right. But obviously, if you're monitoring for policy violations, that has to be down to the individual level. And of course, the permissions are all there to make sure only the right people see that. And you, again, can be incredibly precise about what you want to look for. And then you'll only find those things. Whereas... Other types of moderation require you to look at everything to find the one thing, and they're exposed to your biases. That aspect of the tool is money-saving, increases accuracy, allows you to be very finely tuned and only focus on the things that matter most, whether they're regulatory compliance or whether they're HR compliance or whatever they may be. And on the other side of it, it's all at the group level, and it's all about actionable insights that help you run your company better, support your employees better, learn about new opportunities better, innovate faster. As you pointed out, there's elements of it that can happen in real time. Other elements of it require some processing of the data to kind of collate and summarize, and that happens on a daily basis. Say employee Bill says something on Slack to employee Sue. Bill may not intend to be a pervert or a inappropriate. But in fact, given our policy, what he said has crossed the line. How does that then surface? Because one of the things you've said is coachable moments turn into lawsuits. Mm -hmm. But employee Bill really didn't intend to be a jerk. Walk us through what happens. There's tooling that allows you to be very precise about the actions that get taken based on let's say, how egregious the words might be, mm -hmm. right? If it's just questionable and clearly questionable, you could have it simply send a note to Bill saying, Bill, did you intend to write this message this way? You might want to pay attention to that. If it's maybe the next level up and you want that message to be evaluated before it's posted, there's a way to do that. You can say, just hold that message until somebody looks at it and approves it. Oh, interesting. So if I'm really angry and I write an email and I have the practice of writing it but not sending, the system will say, don't hit send. It pulls the message out and doesn't post it until somebody approves it. Mm, so if it's right. profanity laden, it will... You could, you don't have to, but you could have it pop up and then somebody that's authorized to do so and is trained properly, et cetera, can then mm -hmm. take a look at the message and go, okay, it's not ideal, but there's no evil intent here. Go ahead and post the message. And then you can have like the next level up where you say, no, that's not, we're not going to even allow that to post, right? That'll be, mm -hmm. that'll be redacted from the system. And then that can also have a follow-up message to Bill saying, hey, you're going to notice that your message didn't get posted or got deleted. Here's why. And so it becomes this opportunity for learning to happen. And a person can be involved in that equation as well. So to the conversation, 
conversation that we had previously, the difference between a coachable moment and a lawsuit is typically time. So if sexual harassment occurs and it's dealt with in the moment, I mean, obviously there's cases where it could be just clearly actionable, but even then you'd want it to happen fast, Mm -hmm. right? But if it's coachable and you coach, usually you can reassure the employee that might have been harassed and save the employee that needed to be coached, all of which are good for the company and save you a lot of money and time. But if you, by contrast, that doesn't get caught and it plays out over three months and during that time, the harassed employee believes they've been passed over for a promotion and the pattern of harassment has gone on Mm -hmm. because there's been no consequence for it, now you're in a lawsuit. The average HR lawsuit for those types of incidents settles at about half a million. Doesn't take a lot of those before you, the software pays for itself. Using your example of Ford and another company, I am an employee and executive with Ford F-bombs. That's how I became credible. I go to a company, university, typically not so oriented or permissive for that kind of language. Unaware, I'm just acting as I have. The software can then alert me, alert me. After five times, it may notify somebody to have a real conversation with me. It's built in something like that. You get to define this, right? You get to define the behavior of the software. But if it's language that's inappropriate, you can send a coaching message. And it will do that every time that you do that. Obviously, if there's a long pattern of incidents that involve you, it will get attention. (laughs) It'll be like, you don't seem to be taking the coaching very well, Maureen. Uh, is there something we need to know about? I think the opportunity there is for you to customize it to how you want your culture to emerge. And I, I certainly hope that your listeners don't walk away thinking everybody at Ford is dropping F-bombs every day. That's not what's happening. I just noticed, for me personally, a distinct difference in how interaction occurred in kind of a rough-and-tumble manufacturing world to an insurance company. Yeah, and sorry, I was not intending at all to disparage and have worked in manufacturing environments and had a similar experience, especially as a woman, to be taken seriously because I continue to hear the, oh, excuse my French or pardon my language. But then you follow it with every other sentence is the same way. My eardrums have not burned off and stop treating me like I'm going to melt. (laughs) But back to the point, the software... Then if I own a company, I can develop the settings so that it escalates in whatever way is appropriate for my culture. Exactly. And it gives you that ability, back to the shaman example, you essentially have an automated shaman that's creating the structure and essentially doing the moderation to facilitate the conversation in the way that is most healthy for the culture that you're trying to create, right? And at the end of the day, Companies are no more and no less than a community that chooses to come together to accomplish some business objective. It's not more complicated than that. It feels more complicated than that because you're in a competitive environment, but what's happening at the heart of it is people agree to work together to try and get something done. That's the heart of it. And they agree to do so in a certain way. You know, we have a very distinct culture and aware. We had a 15-page culture deck before we had a pitch deck because it was that important to us to build the sort of company that we wanted to work at, and we wanted to attract people that wanted to work at a company with that culture. And we still use that deck today with every new employee, but then that's backed up by ways we reinforce that culture over time. And one of those ways can be tooling that helps facilitate the conversation the way you want it to be facilitated. You've also mentioned that there's a strong risk management component. Can you talk a little bit about that? And and you made the example of the harassment, clearly risk management and financial consequences. What industry today is not regulated to some degree, but particularly we can focus in on financial services and healthcare and talk about the challenges of managing compliance inside of this freeform chat environment. It's a ready-made environment for people to be authentic and to be just trying to help each other. And you want that to happen, but you want that to happen in a way that doesn't result in a $12 million fine from FINRA because you had the wrong people talking to each other or because you had people using the platform to make trading decisions that they're not allowed to make, which has happened 
check the journal. You can just look at the last month and you could find 20 stories of financial services firms that have had significant fines levied against them for noncompliance, either in their email environment or their chat environment. Most recently, J.P. Morgan Chase had a significant fine levied on them for some of their employees using WhatsApp off-platform to coordinate, you know, work inside the company, which is clearly a no-no. You know, what you want is to give your employees tools that they want to use. Chat-based tools is how people like to communicate. So if you don't have one in your company, guess what your Gen Y and Gen Z employees are going to do? They'll just go off platform. They'll use WhatsApp, they'll use Signal, they'll use just texting, and they'll be doing the work of your company in a platform that's completely invisible to you and potentially doing things that are completely illegal. You know, the best defense in that case is a great offense. Give them the tools and then have the capability to manage those tools in a way that is compliant. And so we do help a lot of companies with that. And there is real dollars tied to that, as we just talked about. These fines are not trivial and they're getting bigger and bigger. Uh, You know, you look at regulation frameworks like GDPR in Europe. The fines for a GDPR violation can be as high as 10% of revenue of the company. That's a big number. Revenue, not profit. Revenue. So if my profit is less than 10%, I'm in the hole. Absolutely. That's how the regulation is written. So these are big teeth. Obviously, the EU is not motivated to put a bunch of companies out of business. But if the crime is egregious enough, they want teeth big enough to match the crime. And you have to make it significant enough to impact the behavior. And so they built the big teeth into the regulation. And you see that in other ways. I think in in some ways, Europe is ahead of the U.S. on some of those things. Like in Europe, most countries there, there's actually progressive pricing for tickets based on your income for a car violation. So if you speed in Europe, certain countries, the size of your ticket is calibrated to your income. I better be careful. (laughs) When you think about that, that's very smart. Otherwise, there's zero consequence to the guy with a Ferrari driving 100 miles over, you know, 50 miles an hour over the limit. It's inconsequential to them to get a $200 ticket. But to somebody who made a lot less money, $200 is a meaningful number. So they have that be progressive so that it actually has the impact that it's intended to have, the behavior modification. And so you're seeing that reflected in regulatory behavior. And you're starting to see that really spill into the U.S. where the regulators are putting bigger and bigger teeth around these compliance issues because they really intend for them to be complied with because there are very real consequences for consumers and customers. And a lot of that has been emerging around privacy, around financial services, et cetera. The price is getting higher and higher for non-compliance. The tools are getting more sophisticated for finding non-compliance. Our view is that your best defense is a good offense. Put the tools in place, put the platforms in place that your employees will use because you want them on your platform, and then have essentially these invisible tools making sure that you're staying compliant over time with them. Not in a way that hampers the employee experience. They don't feel anything, but you'll know when these non-compliant things are happening and you can intervene and deal with them. And the regulators generally look favorably on that. If you're doing the things to manage the environment and you're addressing issues, they're not gonna punish you for having an issue. They're gonna punish you for not doing anything about the issue on a timely basis. It is GDPR compliant, I assume. Aware. Well, one of the very first use cases for us was companies that were trying to be GDPR compliant. One of the very first modules that we developed was for companies in the EU that were trying to become GDPR compliant. So under GDPR, there's some interesting things like what GDPR did fundamentally was shift the ownership of the data from the company you worked for to you. In Europe, as an employee of a company domiciled in Europe, you have the right to do what's called a data subject access request. So you can say to the company, give me all of the data that you have about me and that I have generated in my work here. And the company has 30 days and they have to provide all of that data to you. And then you also have the ability to request a data subject access deletion. So you can say, 
delete it. And the company has 30 days to delete all that data. Well, how does that dovetail then with discovery? So say I am harassing you and I request all my information and I've said terrible things to you. I can request it and delete it and I get to get a pass? The company also has the ability to review that data. And if they think a crime's been committed or something you know, has been done inappropriately, they can retain that data in the same way that you have that today, like legal holds, what we would think mm-hmm. of as a legal hold uh, historically. And if we think that there's data that needs to be held in order to deal with litigation or to address a regulatory issue, the companies have the ability to do that. But in general, the ownership has shifted. So one of the first capabilities that we developed was for companies in the EU that needed the ability to do a data subject access request or deletion. We facilitated that inside of these very complex collaboration tools. And there's important and thorny issues to be dealt with because you have to deal with things like context. These are very snippet-based systems. Keyword search doesn't work. You need the conversation. So we built AI very early on that's incredibly smart at figuring out where a conversation started and stopped around a topic. You also have thorny issues about like you can't delete one side of publicly available conversations. So helping companies distinguish between when you've participated in a public dialogue, you don't have the right to have that conversation deleted because you've already given up your right to privacy by participating in the public dialogue. But if it's a private conversation between you and one other person, you would have the right. So public dialogue within the company or like I post something on Twitter? Public dialogue within the company. So if you've got a general channel, for example, that everybody in the company has access to and you post in it, it'll return that data, but you don't have the right to delete that data because it's in the public domain already. You've given up your privacy rights on that. So the example of your Zoom meeting this morning that didn't happen, everyone who chimed in, that's now public... Right, because you ceded, yeah, you ceded your right to privacy in that case because you were participating in, it, in effectively the town square, right? You're accountable for everything you say in that context, even in the real world, right? We, like, and we sort of have those moments, right? So, yes, and I think some of that is what I'll call emerging law because of these thorny issues. Uh, we're trying to stay very current. So we are a very early participant in data ethics forums that help us manage the ethical aspects of what we do in as progressive a way as possible. And we participate in all kinds of forums where we get insight into the emerging regulatory frameworks around these things because we're learning what it means to give people ownership of their data and what laws and how those laws work effectively in that world. So we think we have to be on the forefront of it because we're providing this set of services to companies who have all of the same questions. As we come to a close, we've talked about employee experience and how the AWARE software helps people be safer, how it helps communicate and reduce some friction, track the sentiment like our shaman, and when there are issues evolving or emerging, the leadership team can take action, everything from parking spaces to difficult systems implemented, all of that. Then you've got the compliance side, all of the things we need to reduce risk and stay compliant with appropriate laws. Where else do you want people to be thinking about good employee experience and good hygiene as a company? I don't think any company, the people at any company, wake up in the morning. I'm, I'm sure, I, I suppose this is not true at one level. There are companies that are that have nefarious intent. Um, so let's set aside the companies that have nefarious intent. I mean, if you look at the hacker world today, it's increasingly organized. These are corporations. They have products for sale. They have financial targets. They have you know, all of that happens, right? So it's set aside companies with nefarious intent. But most companies that don't have nefarious intent don't wake up in the morning saying, I want to be non-compliant or I want to have an unsafe working environment, right? So the question just becomes, what tools are available to you to be a responsible leader, to be a responsible company in today's world? And In general, history has shown us that when you take advantage of those tools that make you a better company, you perform better. Can I tell you precisely how much better 
companies perform when they have tooling like ours in place? Not yet. We don't have sufficient data. I will tell you, though, it's coming because Gallup can tell you that if you have a 0.5 increase in employee engagement, you will see, on average, this kind of improved performance, right? But they've got a sufficient data set to do that. I can leverage their data set because, quite frankly, my tooling is particularly useful for employee engagement, right? But ultimately, we want to be more precise and say, with the data authority to do so, right? The real research to be able to say that if you're not using AWARE, you're foregoing this much opportunity and you're taking this much risk, right? So where we're headed with this is we simply become an essential tool for running a great company. Just like I have teams and I have the little email every day from Viva telling me if I, how many times I've multitasked during a meeting or, (laughs) which would be a lot. While we count things, we think there's more insight on the, the subjective side, on the qualitative insights, right? Counting things is interesting, but it doesn't give you sufficient insight. So we're looking at the subjective, the qualitative side, which we think is where the real powerful insight is. Well, yeah, my Microsoft thing doesn't tell me if people are engaged or if I'm engaged, other than I haven't taken a break, so I am likely sleepy. It sounds like what yours is giving this, especially the sentiment information in real time or the day after, is invaluable to allowing to take corrective action before something goes toxic or if it goes toxic. And if you're waiting for polling data... You're too late, right? How much attrition are companies facing because they didn't listen to their employees? Last year, when Tim Cook first announced that he was going to make all the Apple employees come back to work, if I had been able to call him the next day and say, you know, what if I could have saved you what ended up being tens of millions of dollars and months of his time and attention trying to claw back from that cliff that he jumped over, how much would that be worth to you? I bet it's a big number. And we 100% could have helped him avoid that. All he would have had to do was essentially post, here's some ideas I have. What do you all think? We could have told him the next morning, right? Well, they hated all that and they really liked that. And then he could have tuned his strategy, which he's had to do at great pain anyway, and it's taken forever. All of that could be avoided, right? So you think about the value of that and the value it has for companies that have that capability versus their competitors that don't. Now, there's a little bit of the lie in the Apple case in that how many employees are actually going to walk away from a job at Apple, right? But that's not true of a lot of other companies, right? Like, what's your plan B when you're an Apple employee, right? You're at the, you know, the most successful, most productive, most innovative company in the history of mankind. I'm leaving because I have to come to the office for three days. I bet you're not. But... (laughs) Some might, right? But generally speaking, most companies don't have that high platform to stand on and they've got to be better, right? Because they really do run a risk. And I will tell you that the prospects we're talking to today in their top three concerns, 100% of the time is employee churn. I was just thinking the the whole listening and connected to leadership and the shift from the ego that I know they'll get over it to, I actually have to listen because they will damage my business is a significant shift that we haven't really addressed yet. And I realize that's for another show. Absolutely. And would be happy to talk about that at at length, but it really is a top of the list. And, you know, all the data has existed for a super long time about how much employee churn costs. Right. And so that's an easy example of where there's this obvious business case for the better tooling I have to listen and support my employees, the more likely they are to be engaged, which is less likely churn. And there's easy dollar associations with that. So that's an easy one. At the end of the day, we really just want to be there as a way to help companies be better. Greg, thank you. As always, this is an incredibly insightful conversation, and I realize the range of conversations we have is broad. To our listeners, thank you for joining us, and please follow us on Twitter at IL underscore Institute.